Well, if you'd like to turn your Bibles to John chapter 5, I know we started last time in John chapter 10, but we're just coming back now to John chapter 5. And in this session, having looked at a radical revitalization, how life is the real key for what God wants to do um, in the world, bringing life, we now need to look at what I'm calling a radical reinterpretation. And you're going to see why this is important. It's because, really, if I just to sum it up, the scriptures are meant to be what drives us forward. And yet, it was very obvious in the days of Jesus that they got their Bible, you know. And yet, the way they understood it didn't drive them forward. It led them into confusion and stagnation. So if the church gets into a place of confusion and stagnation, there needs to be a radical reinterpretation. We need to come back and say, come on, what's it really about? And when we get to back to what it's really about, then that will give us the momentum to go forward. So that's why I put this as number two. Radical revitalization for me is number one, but a radical reinterpretation. And you've got to think that was really important in the first century because we're looking at church as at the beginning and working how that could be like church as we want to see it now. But that reinterpretation that was vital then, we need to be prepared to, to look at God's word afresh in every generation. Not to make it say something different, but actually to make sure that we're still understanding what it's saying and we've got it clear. So that's what we're talking about. So John chapter 5, it's got this important statement in there. I'm actually going to read it in, in context. So I will read from verse 31. And Jesus said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You've sent to John, that's John the Baptist, and he's borne witness to the truth. Yet, I do not receive testimony from men, but I say these things that you may be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You've neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify to me, or of me, but you're not willing to come to me that you may have life. I find that incredible and there's a scripture that I would put alongside it which I find equally forceful and that's in Mark chapter 7 and how about this quite remarkable Mark chapter 7 and verse 13 says <clears throat> you make the word of God of no effect through your tradition. It's not amazing. I mean, we, we preach, don't we? The word of God is powerful. It will change everything. And then you discover that tradition can block the word of God. And so in that moment, you've got to be prepared to lay aside your tradition and say, let's just get hold of the word of God. Because the last thing we need to be doing is to block the power of the word of God. We need that. But to have the word and not come to Christ to receive life is equally foolish as to embrace tradition to a level where you block the word of God. Can you see, you're, 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 you lay aside your tradition. You say, right, now the word of God can freely move and have its power. And as Paul wrote in his letter, the word of God is not bound, it's free. But then you reach a point where you, you, you've got the word. You're actually searching the scriptures. But if you don't come to Christ so that you can have life, you're never going to interpret those scriptures correctly. You're going to see them as a bunch of rules and regulations to keep. And, you know, just like having a perfect example in your midst that you can't follow, to have rules and regulations that you can't keep is frustrating. 
And God's not in the business of frustrating us. He's come that we might have life, and that more abundantly. So what can we say about this reinterpretation? And it was so necessary. You know, I'm, I'm totally committed to increasing biblical literacy worldwide. And, and one of the reasons I want to do that is because in a lot of places, there is life. But how sustainable the life is going to be if it's not backed up with scriptures is going to be a big challenge. So what I'm trying to do when I'm out there in different nations is to say, I'm not turning down the life. <laughs> But I want you to see that the scriptures themselves, if you've come to Christ, are going to sustain the life that you have in him. And yet, you know, it's, it's a sad thing. We've got people who've got the life who don't search the scriptures, and we've got people who search the scriptures and don't have the life. And then you get a tension build up, because there are people that are saying, well, we know the scriptures better than you. And we say, well, we know Jesus better than you. But in the end, we shouldn't be having that kind of tension. Because we should be able to, to have such a knowledge of the scriptures and such a grasp on what it is that we can help the people who search the scriptures to understand what the scriptures are really saying. Now, when you look at the first century church, that was a large part of what they did. Before Paul went out and preached to any of the Gentiles, he'd arrive in the town and he'd go into the synagogue where he would preach from the Jewish scriptures. And he would say to them, this is what this means. And they would look at him completely blank a lot of the time. And saying, oh no, that's not how we understand it. Because our tradition says that we interpret it like this. Yeah. And he'd say, your tradition is a problem. <laughs> because, because of your tradition, the word of God is not having any effect amongst you. And we need the Word of God to have effect. If the Word of God starts having effect among you, you're going to know life. <laughs> but if the Word of God is not having any effect, you just end up with a rule book that you can start throwing at other people. And saying, you ought to know this, you ought to know that, you ought to know something else. But what I want to see is a generation of people that have got life, who can interpret the Scripture in the way that Paul did. Hey, look at what he did. I wasn't going to mention this verse because it's such a favourite of mine, but uh, it always creeps in somewhere. You know, where Paul arrives in Thessalonica, uh, in Acts chapter 17, it says this, Now, when they passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preached to you is the Christ. So he was doing exactly what Jesus did with the two on the road to Emmaus. He was taking the scriptures and it says that Jesus started with Moses and went through the prophets and showed them that he'd come to suffer so that they could be liberated and have life. And he just did it from the scriptures. Uh, Jesus uh, in the synagogue at Nazareth begins his ministry by reading the scriptures. He reads part of that amazing passage in Isaiah and he stops at a comma. He doesn't go on to talk about judgment day. He stops and says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, look, you know, this is my first coming. Okay, I'm coming again to bring judgment and all of these things. But my first coming is to bring life. <laughs> and I've come to bring life and I want you to see that. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. And then you get the overflow of all of that, the healing and the power that he brings. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord is the year of Jubilee, where slaves go free, where debt is cancelled. And that's what Jesus had come to proclaim. But he was proclaiming it from the scriptures. And if you really have life, what do you discover? You discover that from Genesis to Revelation, this book is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And what that early church did, it had totally, posh word coming up, this is a word warning, a totally Christocentric interpretation, all right? They interpret everything through the lens of Christ. 
when they were teaching Old Testament history, why did we have to have judges? Because if we didn't know what judges were, we wouldn't understand that a judge is also a saviour. If you look at the judges in Israel, most of them were champions. <laughs> they were there to, to, to bring victory and to deal. That's what a judge is. And yet if we didn't have that, we'd think it was just someone who kept issuing condemnatory statements. So we see these things. And, and then we move on and we discover that when they had judges for a season, they then wanted a king. Well, the first king they got was a problem, but then God gave them a king after his own heart. He gave them David. Why did he give them David? Because David was an opportunity to begin to show what a real biblical king is like. He was a, a type of the one who is to come. So you begin to see just how, as you're going through the Old Testament, look at the priestly system that was set up in the wilderness. Why did they need a priestly system? Because Jesus, who is to come, is the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So in other words, it had been determined from the time the world was made that Jesus would lay his life down to save us from sin. But if you don't introduce a sacrificial system that people can get their heads around, how are you going to teach? <laughs> it's like all these visual aids were put in place. So that Jesus, who is the central point of scripture, it's, it's his story from beginning to end. He's the word that was spoken in the beginning. And he's the lamb that was slain. Who is going to be the one who, who judges the world and sets the new order in place? And he will be the central focus of our worship. And this is what the reinterpretation was about. It was like blowing all the stuffiness out of their interpretations. And you've got to realise that there is a whole lot of things when it says your tradition makes the word of God of none effect. Praise God, we don't have all the traditions written into the Bible. Because they had a whole system of traditions. And some of those traditions were traditions of interpretation. There are places where I've had the opportunity to preach and it's been one of these situations where, where um, the imam will give an Islamic Quranic presentation and then you get a rabbi who will give a, a Jewish presentation and then praise God it's my chance I can get up and do a biblical one, you see. And I love that kind of thing. I mean you get to preach to people that you just never thought you'd get a chance to preach to. But what I notice in those situations is I'm the only one who can speak with any liberty. Because everyone else is saying, if I may refer here to what it says in the Hadith, or if I might refer here to what it says, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I'm just reading the book. It says what it says. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's exactly what it was like. I mean, unless you've been in a situation like that, you don't understand what it was like for the first century church. The way that they preached was not like the way everyone else preached. When it says that Jesus preached with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees, they, they preached having to make reference to what Rabbi so-and-so said in the such and such a century, yep. and that record, and the Hadith does the same if you're doing Quranic interpretation. But when you come to Scripture and you're preaching Christ Jesus, everything just lights up. And that's what it was like. I mean, you have no idea what a surprise it was when Paul stood up to preach in the synagogue. It's like, he's not doing it like everyone else does. <laughs> and when Jesus stood up to preach, well, we don't get this. He doesn't preach like the scribes and Pharisees. He preaches with authority. It sounds as if he knows what he's talking about. Yes. Without having to refer to, you know, as it says in this commentary or this view or that kind of thing. There's a liberty that comes when you've actually grasped the fact that from beginning to end it's about Jesus. Now I'm not sloppy, I'm not just one of these people who says, oh that means Jesus, that means Jesus. I will sort of say, no I want to know how it means Jesus. I want to know why it's in there, why it's important to have that. I want to know why they had to have that period of the Mosaic law 
when in fact the new covenant is a fulfillment of the old covenant that was given to, Moses, uh, to, to Abraham, which was referred to as an everlasting covenant. And it's getting your head around some of those kind of things that are important. And I just want to tell you, yeah, they search the scriptures that they might have life. Some of you have got life. Now get on and search the scriptures. <laughs> because you will be able to give such an incredible reason for the hope that is within you. I'd love to think that if you were walking with the two on the Emmaus road, you would have done almost as good a job as Jesus did. I'm not going to put you right up there with him, but I think that you, know, you should get to know the scriptures well enough that you could take someone you know, all the way through and just show them clearly why all of these things work. And you've got to realise that, that they didn't even know when Jesus started preaching the kingdom, that was like, whoa, 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 well, how are we going to interpret this? Because their understanding of, of kingdom and, and what it was going to be like when the Messiah came was all confused. There were so many things that were confused in their thinking that to try and straighten it out, you'd have thought, is it worth it? Why, why do we bother? Why don't we just go to the Gentiles where they don't know anything and you can start afresh? Because in the end, you need to teach the Gentiles what the Jews knew in the first place, but actually teach them accurately. The Gentiles didn't end up with a scripture-free Christianity. <laughs> But what they got was life that enabled them to see it as life. Now, of course, they really had to know the scriptures in the end because they would come under pressure. The Judaizers were saying, now, come on, you've got to come in the same way as we did. And they had to be able to say, no, we don't need to. And so some of these things we're going to look at later on about how the culture of the kingdom really works. But I want you to see, first and foremost, the, the comprehension of the kingdom, understanding that the kingdom is really central. And, and why the kingdom is essential is, is and, and please, we're getting to the point where we preach the kingdom without preaching the king. And, and, and that's almost like making the same mistake, isn't it, really? That, that if, if the Bible from beginning to end is about Jesus, and all we do is preach kingdom without preaching the king... <laughs> We've almost slipped back into the same trap that we're preaching a system rather than picking up on the central point of Scripture. We can preach a kingdom because Jesus is the King. And once you make Jesus the Lord of your life, you've come into his kingdom. And when you begin to look at his kingdom, you realise that his kingdom extends because his rule and reign, even now he's ruling in the midst of his enemies, one day he's going to rule over his enemies. But even as he's ruling in the midst of his enemies, that kingdom is being established. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is among you, of course he was implying, now I'm here, the kingdom is in your midst. But he was also beginning to give a sense of what the kingdom is. It's an among kingdom. All right, can you cope with that? It's a kingdom that exists within the kingdoms of this world. It can be a global kingdom. And in a sense, and I'm going to come to this in a minute because we're talking about the clash of the kingdoms, it doesn't matter too much what the kingdoms of this world are at at the moment because in the end, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and he will reign forever. But until we get to that point, the kingdom will be among. And there will be those among all of the different kingdoms of the world who own the kingship of Christ. And when you own the kingship of Christ, then actually you're living in an interpretation of Scripture that had not been picked up on for centuries. You might think, how can, how can they have done that? Partly it was tradition. But in the midst of the tradition, there were prophets who longed to see the kingdom. They were, they, were, they were trying to get their head around how it all fitted together, even as they were speaking it out. When the Spirit of God came upon them, just think of David. All right? David had a prophetic ministry. I know he was the king, but he had a prophetic ministry. 
Some people say, well, you know, he's the closest we get in the Old Testament to someone having all of the, the ministries in one. I mean, really, it's only Jesus in the end who's prophet, priest, king, judge, and all the anointed ministries come together. What you then have is a situation in the Old Testament where different people exercise different anointed ministries. So you could have a, a king who was anointed, you could have a prophet who was anointed, you could have a priest who was anointed, some of the judges you could say they were anointed, but when you look at all of those, it's only Jesus who brings it all together. They were all just types of the one who is to come. But David gets close because you can see that he was both a king and a prophet. And in that role, when he was prophesying, because there's something really important that you, you can see the way God brings his word to pass, he never overrides the personality and circumstances of the person through whom he is speaking. So you don't think, I hope you don't think, that you, know, you get a tap on the shoulder one day if you're a biblical writer and you just get told, take this down. You know, you're sort of like a dictation machine. Because what God does is he doesn't override your personality. So when, when David starts writing a psalm, sometimes you get the impression he's, he's sharing his experience. You know, he starts saying, the king is this. And you think, oh, he's talking about himself. But within a few verses, it's, it's taken off. It's, you know, it's sort of like he's got down the runway and it's now airborne and he's no longer talking about himself. He's prophesying messianic truth. And you look at, look at Psalm 45. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. I address my message concerning the king. And, and he's away. And then he starts talking about the king in, in ways you think, this isn't you, David. This has gone far beyond you. And then he starts talking about the queen who's glorious and you think, well, she must be some person. And you realise, no, this isn't, this isn't just one of his wives. This, this is a picture of the church. And it's, 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 it's prophetic, it's, it's taken wings, it's gone. But you can see where it comes from. It comes because God takes someone. I mean, David could talk about shepherding because he's got the experience. But if you think Psalm 23 was written on a hillside, think again. That comes out of a whole life experience, Psalm 23. That was what he'd worked through. He, he knew what it was not just to be a shepherd of a handful of sheep that belonged to Jesse. He'd actually shepherded the nation. And he knew what it was as a shepherd to need to be shepherded. And that's what comes out in these kind of things. And, and these things you discover when you, when, you, when you say, I've got the life, now I'll search the scriptures. <laughs> and I really want you to search the scriptures. And I want you to see what kingdom is. I want you to comprehend what kingdom is. Now Matthew 13 is full of parables of the kingdom. And Jesus taught kingdom in parables for a particular reason because he said that he's putting the truth out there but he wants people to have an experience of him that enables that truth to come alive now if you're a born again person you shouldn't have too much problem understanding Matthew 13 because the spirit that is within you will illuminate the word that Jesus was bringing. So Jesus was setting up a partnership with the parables. He's saying, I'm putting the word out there, but if you know life, then you'll understand what we're talking about. If you don't want to know life, and you're being some sort of, you know, some sort of um, clever, clever swat who says, well, actually, I, you know, I can tell you more about mustard seeds than you've ever known in your life. You know, and you think, well, you've missed the point, all right? You've missed the point. I can tell you more about this, and you think, yes, but you're missing the point because the story is not a biology lesson on mustard seeds, all right? Or the parable of the sower is not meant to be an educational exercise on farming, although I'm, I'm sure everything lines up, okay? And the dragnet parable is not meant to be telling you how you should do your fishing. It's their parables of the kingdom. And, and people would, the only people who got it were the people who were getting it. I know that sounds obscure, but Jesus said, those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So in other words, he's saying, I'm trying to open you up in ways. I'm trying to get you to think things that you've not thought before. And I'm telling you these stories because it'll help you understand. So I'm just going to read a few verses from Matthew 13. I'll just read 31 to 33. Two parables. 
Another parable Jesus put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it's greater than, than the herbs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Okay, I don't know what you're going to make of that. I, I've heard all kinds of interpretations. And um, people interpret it according to their own concerns. So if you're one of these people who's really concerned that there are dodgy people in your church, you're probably thinking, you, you know, I know what birds are because I read the parable of the sower. And the bird is a picture of the devil who comes to steal the seed. And so if we've got birds in the branches, there are devils in the church. And I'm going to find them and I'm going to get them out. You know, there are some people who interpret it like that, okay? Yeah. Actually, all it means is a big tree, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Enough for birds to come and live in the branches. And if your church doesn't have a few birds living in the branches, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> because your church has obviously become so exclusive and, and, and you've, you've got such a, an efficient bird scarer who stands at your door every Sunday to make sure only the right people come in. You should be welcoming the birds to lodge in the branches, you know? Sometimes the birds have to sit there a while before they realise it's better to be a branch than a bird. And, and the easiest way to find out whether you get, you've got birds or branches, just have a disaster in the church, because all the birds fly away and you know, they're gone. <laughs> you can find out very quickly your birds and branches when you have a, a challenge like that. But what we need to do is to get to the point where, yeah, okay, the birds are there, but you know, what we're, we're saying, praise God for that, that's good. But obviously, we, we do in-house evangelism at that particular point. We want the birds to become branches. <laughs> but you don't have to go on a sort of demon hunt just because you read that the mustard seed grows and the birds are in the branches. The main point of this parable, and most parables just have one point. I mean, some of them have more like the parable of the prodigal son has obviously got two very different stories running side by side. The story of the, the one who ran away and the story of the, the one who, who stayed at home. And they're, they're both important stories. And, and, and part of the story that was being said is that, that, come on Israel, you're like the brother who stayed at home. How are you going to respond? And they knew that it was a pointed story. And, and what we've got here as the main point of the story is that the kingdom grows. The kingdom grows. That, that, that's the main point, all right? We can be clever, you know, you can, you know, sort of get your Coleman's mustard stories out and all of these kind of things, but the main point of this is the kingdom grows. That someone just puts a little seed into his ground, in the land he owns, that's, that's there in the parable, isn't it? And it grows. And it becomes bigger than you ever expected. And guess what? The birds start lodging in the branches. Okay, that's, that's it. And that's the purpose of the parable. And it grows bigger than you could possibly imagine. So he's, he's basically saying, this thing is going to start small and grow big. <laughs> and we need to hold that. Because, you know, I don't know where the church is at at the moment, but a lot of congregations and places and parts around the world, they're managing decline. And part of the reason they're managing decline is because they're accepting decline. Yep. Because they, they've got this idea that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard tree that will shrink to a seed. <laughs> Whereas actually it's meant to go the other way, folks. <laughs> it's meant to get bigger, it's meant to grow, it's meant to expand. And actually the DNA of the kingdom is still expansion. It is. It's just in the makeup of the kingdom. You put the seed in the ground, it will grow. And it will grow bigger than you expect. It might not grow into an oak tree. If you wanted that, you planted the wrong seed. But it will grow. And that's, that's the first thing. The next parable. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. Now, if you're a Bible scholar, you'll know that at the Feast of Passover, they were told to get rid of all the leaven. And when Paul writes to the church about that, he said, because leaven is a picture of sin. Okay? And so, how do people read this? They say, well, oh, this woman who comes, and it would be a woman, to put the, 
to put the leaven in has brought sin into the church. And you think, well, where did you get that? Because it's a parable of the kingdom and it's a picture, it's another picture of kingdom growth. Now, it just shows how superficial some people's Bible knowledge is. Because, okay, for Passover, they had to eat unleavened bread. But at Pentecost, they had to eat bread made with leaven. So what does that mean? It means that at Passover, you take the sin out, and at Pentecost, you bring all the sin back in again. (laughs) No, of course it doesn't mean that. What it means is that whereas at Passover, the leaven represents sin, At Pentecost, it represents the power of the Holy Spirit. And because you're celebrating, you're going to be celebrating, eventually when Jesus sends the Spirit, the Passover celebration is going to be a coming of the leaven into the lump. (laughs) Then that's why they were told, cook your bread with leaven. It's not Passover, it's it's Pentecost. I think I've got the Pentecost and the Passover, but you can sort that one out in your head. Okay, Passover... No leaven. Sin goes. Lamb takes away the sin of the world. Pentecost, leaven goes in because it's a picture of the spirit coming into the church. The leaven goes into the lump and it begins to transform everything. And these are parables of the kingdom. In the end it's saying all of this comes together. When the spirit comes to be the leaven in the lump, It's almost like it's a kingdom picture that the kingdom is dependent upon the spirit of God. And do you know one of the things I I, I want to say on the back of talking in that first session about the revitalization? We are not going to get a revitalization in the church just by talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not going to happen. But do you know why? Because you'll set up attention. What does the Holy Spirit want to do? He wants to glorify Jesus. So all the time you're saying, no, 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 we don't want to talk about Jesus, we want to talk about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said, I don't think I'll turn up to that meeting. (laughs) That's not my agenda. My agenda is to glorify Jesus. So if you've got a situation where you're glorifying Jesus, the Holy Spirit will feel perfectly at home. I'm not trying to give you formulae in this session to say, right, now we've all got to go out there and all preach lots of sermons on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I don't think that's going to work. I think there's a lot of people that are going to say, oh, I've been there, heard that, done that, that's called charismatic movement or called Pentecostalism. I'm I'm, I'm tired of labels. I just want everyone who names the name of Jesus to know the abundant life that Jesus brings. If they get there because you preached a sermon on getting born again, praise God. <laughs> they got there because you talked about the outpouring of the Spirit, that's great. It's, they got there just because you preached on, on life from, from John 10, that's brilliant. We need people to just know the life of the Lord Jesus. And you don't condemn people. You don't say to people, oh, you've been around a long time by now, you ought to know these kind of things. But you know, the disciples were around a long time and they didn't get it. (laughs) And there's a lot of people who, you know, they've they've been huddled up alongside Jesus in church. They love the songs, they love this, they love the miracles, they love the other, but they still don't have life. But you know, you can be polite. You can say, you know, that little bit of life you have got. You think, well, it's a job to find it, but but you can have so much more. And it's sometimes when you're talking about the more that people realise that they haven't got much to start with. But we're not in the business of trying to push people away. We're in the business of trying to say to people, there's life for you to have. And to try and then help people understand that the kingdom grows. The kingdom grows. That this is exciting. That what you've come into is actually a movement. And you might say, well, where's the momentum in the movement? Well, be the momentum in the movement. And that's where we've got to get to. If there have been people who have been sitting around a long time, we've lost their momentum, let's find some people who can put the momentum back into those who once had it. 
if we've got denominations that are sitting around who seem to have lost their momentum, I can tell you, most of them have more momentum to start with than we've got now. So let them tell their story and then say, cool, wouldn't it be great if you saw that happen again? And they'd probably agree with you. And they say, but history is history. And you say, mm, uh, the God who did it once can do it again. He can do it again. Oh, times have changed. Yeah, okay, times have changed. But, hey, Jesus is still Jesus. <laughs> and he's not limited <laughs> You know, when he did it in the 1700s, believe it or not, it's a job to tell the, some folk this, but it wasn't the first time he'd done it. <laughs> and it won't be the last time he's done it either. So let's grasp it. And let's say we do get kingdom. We don't get everything about it. We're learning. We do get kingdom, but we do know that kingdom is meant to grow. We know that it's about Jesus. We know that he's the one who is the king and we're coming under his rule and his authority, and there's something exciting about that. And, and, and it, can, it can grow in, in every nation. And this is really something that I want us to understand, because when we're looking at the culture of the kingdom, and let me just come back a little bit, because in that first session I was talking to you about the sheep that are mentioned in, Luke, uh, in John 10, and saying, don't just think they're sleepy sheep that just wander around eating grass and all the rest of it. But I just want to clear up a point. You see, I, I am very committed to dynamic Christianity, all right? But I'm also quite careful about how I interpret the word. So I love the fact that people want to preach that principle from... Matthew eleven twelve, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Okay? So we're out there telling everyone, take it by force, take it by force, take it by force. Okay? <laughs> but actually what Jesus said, from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. And what does the now mean? It means, but now, it's different. <laughs> So you don't have to go out there telling people, take it by force, take it by force. Because Jesus said, fear not, little flock. It's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's not polite to snatch what you're being offered. <laughs> huh? You need to receive it and realize the enormity of what is being given to you. We are being given the kingdom. Absolutely amazing, isn't it? We're being given the kingdom. And okay, it, it probably will be a few violent folk who want to take it by force. But I tell you this, we're not meant to be taking the kingdom by force. We're meant to be taking the devil's kingdom by force. We're taking God's kingdom by grace. We receive it. We say, now I've got that. Now I want to go and start raiding enemy territory. <laughs> I want to start taking back kingdom from him. Because I know ultimately the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ. And there are places where there are people that are ensnared in the enemy's kingdom. And, and to be honest, just as I was ensnared in the kingdom of the enemy, I know that God has taken me out of that kingdom and brought me into a new kingdom. And I know that if I go out there into the enemy's camp, I'll find people who I can take out of that kingdom and bring into this kingdom. So let that be the kingdom that suffers violence. Uh, and let's just receive the kingdom that we're being given and be grateful for it and then get on and live under the lordship of Jesus, you know? You don't have to persuade him to be your king. You just acknowledge him to be your king. And when you acknowledge him to be your king, the life flows in your life and you become a kingdom person. You begin to see the scripture in terms of his kingdom. And you, you also are comfortable with the fact that the kingdoms of this world are not yet his kingdom. But he has a kingdom in the midst of the kingdoms. Psalm 110. I keep coming back to this psalm. Um, because it's one of those amazing psalms. And I, and I love this. When, when David appears to be eavesdropping into conversations that are taking place in heaven. 
You get that in the early Psalms, you get it further on in the Psalms, but here in Psalm 110, David is saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Now, hold on, let's unpack that, all right, because there's lots of lords in there. Basically, what David hears is God the Father, the Lord, says to the Lord Jesus Christ, my Lord, so that's David's point of identification, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand, so this is Jesus seated at the right, seated at the right hand of the Father, until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay? So he's ruling. I was, I was asked to take place in a... I, I turned up to encourage someone in their church plant and they made me an actor in the play. All right? Now, I had to play, very honoured, uh, the father. And I had alongside me this son who, who kept wanting to get up and do things and I had to keep telling him, sit down, sit down, sit down, all right? But the impression that we were meant to convey, and we weren't really good at it because I don't think either of us were necessarily convinced with this particular interpretation, <laughs> that the reason that the son had to sit down was that all the responsibility for ruling and reigning was delegated to the church. Well, it's a great, great message. And that is true, but I don't think that's what this psalm is saying. I don't think that actually, at this point in time, Jesus is sitting in heaven, exercising no authority whatsoever, whilst the church runs around doing everything for him. I actually think he is very much reigning at this particular point in time. I do, because the next verse, and this is what happens if you only read one verse, the next verse actually says, the Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. So whilst he's sitting there, the rod of his strength is being sent out with authority and he's ruling in the midst of his enemies. Now, this is something that you could see Jesus doing in his earthly ministry. He ruled in the midst. I mean, come on, folks. He didn't have to overthrow the Romans in order to establish a kingdom. In fact, he said, my kingdom not of this world, else my servants would fight. But there's no doubt that he was establishing a kingdom. So Pilate has this problem. He says, so you're a king then? He said, well, you say that I am. Oh, goodness me. <laughs> because it was true. Jesus was establishing a kingdom. A bigger kingdom, a more authoritative kingdom. But he wasn't having to overthrow the other powers in order to establish it. And I really want you to understand this because when I'm talking about the culture of the kingdom, I want to tell you that kingdom culture can exist within any culture. Okay? So we as the church, in a situation where society may not be embracing all of the principles they once embraced, we don't have to throw up our hands in horror and go, oh, how can we be the church in such a godless society? As if the only way we can be the church is if all the boxes are ticked in the way that we would like them. We can still be the church. We can still have kingdom culture. And I tell you, if we understand what culture we've got, we'll actually be more transformative because we'll be ruling in the midst instead of surrendering in the midst. Do you understand what I'm saying by that? A, there should be an authority in the church. I, I want to see the church have confidence that actually there's a culture of the kingdom which we can hold to. And okay, the world might not understand it, but it doesn't need to compromise it. We don't have to dilute it. This is kingdom. But let me talk just in the last few minutes about the clash of kingdom. Because there were plenty of kingdom cat clashes in the book of Acts and in the New Testament. You can see them in the letters. There were kingdom clashes. But you know what was extraordinary? You get the impression that most of the kingdom clashes were in evangelistic territory. 
It was where Paul would step in and say, you need to recognize Jesus as the king. And the kingdom clash would then come up on, but we have no king but Caesar. All right? Now, when you look at it, you quickly discover that that was an excuse because those who were saying we have no king but Caesar were probably more rebellious against Caesar than anyone could possibly be. But what they were using was they were hiding behind the sort of Hellenistic Roman culture to say we don't actually want a kingdom culture. You've come here and you're turning the world upside down because you're saying there's another king, there's Jesus. And Jesus has got expectations on how you should live. And the way he expects you to live, he expects you to be meek and lowly of heart. And, and we tell you that we know that doesn't work. That if you don't beat the living daylights out of them, they're never going to take any notice of what you say. And we say, well, we believe it's different. Okay? We can go out as sheep amongst wolves because we come from a sheep culture. I can't see any point at all in the church trying to adopt the culture of the world to win the world. And what on earth is that about? And the world's going to say at some point, why should we go for that? We've already got it. What are you, what are you offering us that's new? And what we come in and we say, you don't have to do it that way. I know it says you're to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's good, but it doesn't mean to say that your business practices should be serpent-like. <laughs> I, I know that it's a bit like when Moses was confronted with those magicians and he threw his rod down on the floor and it became a snake. And they threw their rods down on the floor and it became a snake and you'd think, oh, well, that's just what it's like, you know. That's, that's business world, isn't it? It's snake eats snake. But it's your snake that eats their snakes in the end. Because I get the impression that, that if, we, if you can bear with this, I know it sounds a little bit crazy, but I think that his snake was always a rod. If you follow what I mean. The basic essence of Moses' snake was that it was a rod of authority. Okay? It could go down on the floor with the others, <laughs> but it still basically was a rod of authority. But what they put on the ground... When their rods turned into snakes, they were manifesting their true nature. And the question that I ask myself is, is if when we are being serpent-like, what nature are we manifesting? Are we just still manifesting that Christ-like nature that's able to engage at that lower level? Or are we exhibiting our true nature, which is a dog-eat-dog, -dog, snake-eat-snake kind of nature? Do you follow what I mean? And I think there's a kingdom culture that works in every culture. I don't think we have to hide. We can go into the business world. We can go into these places. We can be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. And don't try and do it the other way around. Be as wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. Because you won't get very far. But can you see there is a kingdom culture that we carry? And the thing I want to also add, and I'm going to come on to this in the next session, Yes, the persecution was mainly political in those days. They didn't, it wasn't mainly ethical. I know there were ethical issues where they were saying, you know, in the kingdom of God, these are our standards. But they weren't necessarily imposing those standards on the world around them. Even though they could say to the world around them, actually these are God's standards, not just our standards. But even if you don't adopt those standards, it doesn't mean we're going to compromise our standards. And one of the things that's crazy, I want you to see that the church is the place where labels come off. The world at the moment is crazy in tying labels on people's lives. Children have to identify their orientation. I mean, come on, give them a chance to grow up. And then maybe they don't want a label. But we're busy tying labels on. And then we're told, you're not accepting people's labels. I'm, I'm, do you know, I want to accept people. I want to accept people. And I don't want people to be labelled for life because of some decision they made in their teens or some crazy moment that they had when they'd been bereaved or something like that. I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not being prescriptive here. The world can be what the world can be. But I'm just saying that I wish the world didn't go down this crazy route of tying on labels. 
And I hope that what the church can say is, come in, brother, come in, sister. I don't know how many labels you've got when you walk through the door, but we're prepared to put them all in a bucket and say goodbye to them because you're here for who you are in this place. And you just self-identify. You can just use whatever name. I remember uh, doing this event at some university and it was pretty intense, you know. It was one of a multi-faith thing. And they came up afterwards and said, um, so tell me, how do you identify? So I said, I'm Hugh, how do you identify? <laughs> and I, I didn't realise afterwards it was such a loaded question. You know, I was meant to say, I'm an evangelical Christian who believes this and not sure about that, something else. And I just thought, I don't care about the labels. And I think we've got to get to that kind of place. So that's kingdom culture. And that's a little bit of, of the message that we bring. And I hope it helps because I think that if the church is more like that and less tied up with traditions and these kind of things and we actually preach Christ and him crucified and risen again and giving us life, that it's actually going to see a powerful move of the Spirit of God. So are you one with me in this? I think you are. So let's pray. Father, we do just ask that you'll help us to be people who comprehend kingdom culture, that actually want to demonstrate kingdom culture and have this passion to just live kingdom and not to compromise, but at the same time not to be so impositional because we are so insecure that we can't rule in the midst and can only rule by being on top and saying we're right and unless you submit to what we say we can't live amongst you. Lord, help the church yet again be yeast in the barrel, a seed in the ground that can grow and make a difference in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.